Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, just so you're a heads up, um, when it comes close to kind of timing where I need to switch a question, I was thinking I would do the raise a hand feature if you can't see me. I don't know how everybody has their screen set up. Um, so I'll, I'll actually raise my hand, but I'll also do the raise the hand on the Zoom call. So that way you know to kind of wrap up what you want. So that way we can let somebody else kind of talk for a little bit before moving on. Give me give it a couple more minutes just in case, and then we can start. Okay, well, I don't want to delay too long and I have a little intro spiel, so I'll do my intro spiel and hopefully people will log in so that way then they can be present for the questions as we all start that. Um, so, greetings distinguished guests and panelists. I'm delighted, delighted to welcome you to this online panel discussion, identifying patterns in complex and fragmented conflict landscapes, Papua New Guinea. I'm Dr. Caitlin Steiner, a data scientist for the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilizations Operations, CSO, at the U.S. Department of State. And it's a pleasure to be your moderator for this discussion. The Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations is charged with leading the formulation and imp implementation of the U.S. Conflict Prevention and St Stabilization Strategies, Policies, and Programs. CSO is the state's department's lead for executing the U.S. strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability, in which Papua New Guinea is a key partner. CSO is dedicated to using data-driven insights and innovations for peace building and prevention to address conflicts impacting US national interests. Across the globe, we see the trend of increasingly long and complex conflicts. This session will be dedicated to the role of data analytics in identifying and understanding the actors, impacts, and patterns of highly fragmented conflict landscapes. Reports point towards this trend in Papua New Guinea, where fighting between ethnic and cultural groups is compounded by external forces. The proliferation of small arms, the concentration of wealth, and the changing norms around conflict management, to name a few. As policymakers increasingly seek to base their decision on data, we hope this panel will help illuminate how analysis on fragmented conflicts can help Papua New Guinean peace builders and the international community better understand the context in which they work. Today, we are fortunate to be joined by leading experts with extensive knowledge in data collection and analytics in conflict-affected regions, as well as vast experience in exploring how data can support peace building in Papua New Guinea. As we dive into our conversation, I encourage, encourage the audience to actively participate by sharing your thoughts, comments, and questions in the chat. Uh, we will reserve a few minutes at the end of the discussion to address any questions. Um, so before we dive into our actual discussion, I'd like each of our distinguished panelists to briefly introduce themselves. Um, can you share your background and expertise in the field? And let's begin with Miranda. Oh, good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for the opportunity to join with you. Um, I think this is a really important topic. I've been, I'm a professor at the Australian National University, and I've been working in um, the area of law and justice in Papua New Guinea since about 2013. Before that, I taught at the University of the South Pacific in Vanuatu. Uh, but in Papua New Guinea, I've been really focusing on sorcery accusation related violence and um, seeking to find out data about who has been impacted, you know, who are the perpetrators, what are the kinds of patterns behind um, accusations, what leads them towards becoming violent, and what tends to stop them from being violent as well, because we found that about two thirds of accusations don't actually lead to violence. So, you know, what is it that that stops that from happening? I've also been um, doing more recent work on 
intergroup fighting in um, in PNG, again, trying to identify uh, the, the broad patterns of both the drivers of that and what um, tends to attenuate it. And um, another project has been looking at mapping um, different forms of non-state justice institution that exist across Papua New Guinea, because at the moment, we sort of we understand where the village courts are, which are the lowest level of um, formal court in the country. But below those, there is this enormous um, diversity in terms of institution that is responsible for maintaining um, peace and harmony at that very, very grassroots level. But often they're quite invisible to um, to anybody who isn't a very local person. And so I'm trying to um, to map where they exist and what form they take and who are the people who sit on them as well. Because we often find that there is a combination of um, both uh, um, sort of local leaders, but then also um, faith leaders and um, and also often ward councillors, for example, so parts of the state too, all coming together in these hybrid conglomerations. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Um, Laura, we'll go to you next. Hello, it is a pleasure to be on uh, on this panel. My name is Laura Sorita and I'm a research manager for East Asia Pacific at ACLED, which stands for the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project. I oversee the coverage of political violence and demonstrations across Papua New Guinea. ACLED collects nationwide real-time data on events happening on the ground in Papua New Guinea capturing key information, uh, including the date, actors, location, fatalities, uh, and also the type and modalities of reported violence. Uh, we are collecting data consistently according to a clear and transparent methodology, which allows the users to analyze and visualize trends over time. Uh, we also use different tags to capture specific trends in the data such as uh, violence targeting women or violence related to sorcery accusations. Um, ACLED data is public and uh, it is published on a weekly basis. Uh, it is used to inform journalism, academic research uh, and public discourse on conflict and also to support the work of uh, policymakers. Uh, my team and I are also producing regular analysis on the trends that emerge from our data. Uh, when And we also engage with experts and partners on the ground uh, to ensure that we have the contextual understanding of uh, what is being reported in open source media. And of course, this translates into better data. Um, I'm honored to be a part of this panel today, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Glad you could join us for this as well. Um, Luke, you want to be next? Uh, sure. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Luke Condra. I'm an associate professor uh, of international affairs at University of Pittsburgh in the Graduate School of, of Public and International Affairs. I'm a political scientist by training. Um, I, I study the, the politics of, of state building in kind of more conflict ridden emerging democracies and the substantive or, or policy areas I've been most interested in are elections, public goods provision, and, uh, and political violence. And most of my research to date has really focused on those issues in Afghanistan um, and, you know, used some of the findings from, from some of that work to informally advise different uh, organizations in, in that space on counterinsurgency, economic development policy. Uh, but more, you know, much more relevant to, to our discussion today is I'm, I'm now working on a project about the long-term uh, economic and political effects of state building strategies in colonial era uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, so this involves tracing the police or Kiot patrols and activities based on archival records and then trying to link those up to more contemporary political and economic activity in the country using survey data to see kind of how successful or unsuccessful were those early efforts to you know, reduce intergroup violence, spur economic development, and promote political participation, um, and hopefully to have something to say about contemporary challenges, of which I think we're going to talk about today. Uh, so this fits within you know, my research interests, but I'm also really motivated by having grown up in PNG. Um, I spent my childhood and, and adolescent years in both 
the Eastern Highlands province and uh, New Ireland. So I'm very happy to, to be here today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Luke, for joining us as well. And then William. Oh, William, you might still be on mute though. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, great, great. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, opportunity and I'm pleased to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, I am William Kiponki. I'm working with the uh, Papua New Guinea National Research Institute. And I'm a research officer here. And uh, I've been working in this space for the last six years, especially uh, doing some research on sorcery accusation related violence in Papua New Guinea. Uh, prior to that, I was I was with the Catholic Church as a as a as a as a, as a Catholic uh, uh, seminarian aspiring to be one of the priests. And with that experience for the last uh, fifteen years, traveling widely all around Papua New Guinea has given me some understanding of the different cultures and different. Uh, ethnic groups and different ways of doing things in Papua New Guinea, which is very complex uh, country with many cultures and uh, customs and beliefs. And when engaged in this uh, space on sorcery accusation related violence, I think I have been traveling all around Papua New Guinea, collecting data, interviewing people, uh, visiting survivors and uh, talking to them, uh, trying to identify the needs and then also writing reports uh, doing a bit of publications. Uh, and I have experts on the ground, like Professor Miranda, Professor Gibbs, who was able to you know, uh, do the analysis and then present some of these informations that we can see the scope and uh, the intensity of the issue. And I, I'm, I'm really uh, getting involved in, in that area. And I'm, I'm, I'm still doing some work with uh, Miranda and uh, uh, Philip Gibbs in this space, and I, I am I'm pleased to say a lot of things that I have as you as we move on. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, and I think you're stateside, U.S. side right now, so appreciate you spending some time in your busy schedule, I'm sure. Um, so I wanted to kick off kind of our first question. Um, I'm going to be aiming it at Laura to take a first stab at it. Um, why is data collection around complex conflict or fighting so important? Even data collection is essential when trying to understand complex conflict contexts, uh, like the one in Papua New Guinea. And by event data, I mean key information associated with each event, such as the date, actors, location, number of fatalities, and the modalities of violence, among other data points. Uh, the advantages of data collection are multiple. Uh, first, it gives a granular understanding of violence patterns, geographically, across time, and also in terms of the nature and type of violence. ACLE data suggests that political violence in Papua New Guinea uh, is prevalent and endemic throughout the country. And it is also all, often driven by identity factors such as affiliation to a clan or a tribe. Identity-based groups uh, routinely resort to violence to settle disputes, and the state is often unable to prevent it or respond adequately. There is both premeditated violence rooted in longstanding conflicts, um, as well as spontaneous violence in response to trigger events such as a theft or a murder. Second, looking at PNG nationwide data that has been collected consistently over time uh, helps us go more in depth into the patterns. For example, we can see in the data uh, the history of interactions between certain clans or tribes that fought across time at uh, what were the grievances and triggers of past violence. Third, data can support policymaking um, and humanitarian response as it is capturing key features of violent events in a meaningful way, allowing for more informed decisions. 
there has been renewed interest and attention in Papua New Guinea uh, by global actors. And having tools such as the athlete data helps stakeholders to make better decisions. For example, using data helps us to understand more about the role of the state in managing conflicts um, in the country and also the uh, significant challenges it faces. And so this is valuable for anyone looking to strengthen security across the country. And lastly, um, tracking data and identifying patterns over time uh, can also allow for the development of early warning indicators of likely escalations in violence or insecurity. Um, so ACLED has recently introduced an uh, early warning tool with significant success in multiple contexts, and we are currently working to adapt it to, to the Papua New Guinea context. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, would any of our other panelists like to chime in? Okay. Um, so then kind of switching and kind of focusing more on kind of data collection strategies. Um, so there's often concerns regarding the comprehensiveness of conflict and violence assessments in highly localized and fragmented conflicts, making it challenging to accurately establish baselines and trajectory patterns. What are the unique challenges and complexities that arise in areas experiencing active violence or infighting? Uh, specifically, how do those challenges impact data collection and analysis efforts? Um, I will leave it to Miranda or Luke to take a first step. Miranda, would you like to go first? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm really interested to hear the, Laura's discussion about the data that ACLED has got. So I'll, I'll be really, um, I'd like to know how you're accessing um, the, the data sources that you've been spoke, speaking about. Um, certainly the I've been trying to get data recently on um, on intergroup fighting. And, you know, really in general across PNG, there is an absence of, um, of reliable data. So the last census was conducted in 2011. Um, it was widely believed to be very flawed. So we really don't have any, um, you know, population-wide data since 2000. Um, there's active debate as to whether or not the population of PNG is between 9 or 17 million. You know, there's just, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty there. And then when you add on trying to collect data in um, places where you have active violence and fighting, then there are things such as displacement of people um, who then, you know, either they have been killed or they've gone, you know, and they're hiding away in the bush. Um, we yeah. just don't know. Uh, their, you know, communications are often interrupted. Uh, people lose their mobile phones. People lose their numbers. So um, keeping track of that is very, very difficult. There is opportunistic land grabbing that occurs. And so sometimes people never return to their, um, their home places. Um, fighting burns down um, and then the, the state closes those in some of those institutions that do keep records, however rudimentary, like police posts, aid posts, um, schools, and so forth. Uh, so again, we just, we, we don't have evidence um, from them. Uh, we have to rely very much on eyewitness accounts as to, you know, who has been killed, who has been wounded, and those are obviously highly subjective. Um, the stigma of reporting rape and um, sexual violence, which anecdotally is increasingly being used, unfortunately, as a weapon in, the, in intergroup fighting, um, means that often it isn't reported. And so we just, um, we don't know the extent to which that is occurring. And often that isn't being reported upon in newspapers. That's the, the main source that I've been relying on. Um, but I found that, you know, only... 7% of the newspaper reports that I've looked at specifically mention um, women and girls being killed, for example, um, and only 9% talk about women and girls being injured and displaced. And the same thing with regards to children. There just there isn't that specific reporting about different um, classes of victims. And of course, you know, when you're dealing with um, trauma, uh, danger, hunger, then data collection is not at the top of anybody's priority. However, um, it's been really interesting to me um, that I've been working with a number of NGOs recently 
who have been asking for assistance in trying to record the level of um, violence that is occurring in their communities, particularly in relation to um, sorcery accusation related violence, where they have been appalled to find these kind of these pockets of their um, of their communities with really high levels. And so they they can see the real value in recording that in order to draw attention um, to the problem. So I think that collecting data uh, is critical. I would totally agree with Laura, but it is challenging. Yes, definitely agree. Um, Luke, do you have anything to add to Miranda's comment? Uh, yes, yes, I do. I mean, so this is a really good question. You know, so uh, unique challenges, complexities that arise here um, for 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 you know thinking about establishing baseline and um, and thinking about patterns. So the, I mean, the in thinking about this, the I wanted to kind of focus on one problem here. I think um, there there are many, as uh, as Miranda was just talking about. I, I think a primary concern here for those who are interested in doing work in, in Papua New Guinea, but in other places like it, is thinking about how the data that you end up with might be problematically different from the true or, or real version of events or phenomena that you're trying to capture and study. And so what's tricky here is knowing whether there's systematic bias in your data of that kind, and then what that implies for how you should handle the data in any analysis that you're doing. So an application here that I thought we'd be talking about you know, quite a bit is in, in having media reporting as the source for data collection on violence or any other number of, of things. And, and I mean, there's different problems with that, but I mean, one is like a selection problem. So um, media either choose or they're, they're constrained in some way to report on certain events, but not others. Uh, there's like a demand side to that problem. Like media maybe think that we want some kinds of information, but not other kinds. And so they're going to select into a particular type of reporting. But then there's a supply side too. Like some events just don't get reported because the information doesn't reach whatever organization it is that's that's collecting it for whatever reason. I mean, maybe it's geographic remoteness, but it could be a number of things. Um, I got an example of this from, from my own work from uh, some years ago. I partnered with the Post Courier in the country to go through all of their archives um, starting just after independence through the early 90s. And I captured uh, through taking thousands of pictures of their physical uh, print copies, um, examples that they had in their archives of intergroup violence to, to code on, on different aspects of those episodes or the, the, you know, those incidents. But you know, th that's going to be problematic in different ways for, the, for, the, for what I was just saying. And, and it's really like if violent incidents or events are missing from, from units and that missingness is, is correlated with factors that we think might be responsible for for variation and violence that we're trying to understand and explain, then, then we have a problem. And, and particularly in the context of trying to do analysis, um, kind of connecting and, and looking at relationships between things. So like poverty would be an, an obvious kind of example. Um, and you know, there's fixes in the literature for this, but they all rely on making certain assumptions about the nature or size and direction of the bias. Um, for those interested, I'm, I'm pulling heavily from uh, Niels Weidman's uh, really nice article on this from the American Journal of Political Science, and he discusses these issues in the context of, you know, violence data kind of subnationally and, and ways to diagnose whether your data might be biased and then what you could do about it if you want to move to the next stage to, to be as responsible as you can. But I mean, as, as Miranda was saying, like, there's just only so much one can do in really data scarce environments. And so I think the strategy is you do the best you can, and then you think really hard and carefully about, well, what's the, you know, what, what are the different kinds of bias that might be here? And how do I then responsibly handle that for, um, for interpreting the results? And in particular, like if you're sharing the results and findings for, you know, policy implications, you know, we have a responsibility to do the best we can with that, but um, there's only so much you can do. Points, great points. Um, totally agree. Um, so unless somebody else would like to interject, 
Um, I will move on to the next question. Um, this one is for William. Uh, Papua New Guinea is a highly diverse country with more than 800 languages and among the most rural na national populations in the world, with much of the population residing in remote areas that are hard to reach given the rugged terrain. Um, in your experience, how can data collection strategies be adapted to suit the context of Papua New Guinea? Thank you. Yes, I think uh, it, it, is, it is very complex and uh, uh, with regard to data collection, there's a lot of difficulties to it. And uh, firstly, when you look at Papua New Guinea as, as it, uh, the geography of it itself, uh, it's very costly when you want to collect a very reliable data information from the different provinces and districts and the regions. Because you are always using the air transport and it's already really costly. And secondly, when you look at the uh, the actual information collecting from the people, there's a lot of risk involved. Because when you look at sorcery, particularly, people will not easily disclose the information. And if ever people learn that that information has been uh, leaked out to the media or to some authorities, the relatives of the people on the ground will start questioning who was the one who brought out the information. So there's a risk involved in trying to extract those data from the people. And also, uh, thirdly, when trying to identify the reliable sources of the information that is put up in social media sometimes, when there is an event coming up, I mean, event or the incident of the uh, the reliability of the information that we collect, it has to be uh, traced back to the original event or the issue, and then you can really extract what has happened, how it has happened. And, and that has been also a, a bit of a, a, a complication or difficult because no one can really try to come up so clearly and own up what has been put up in the media. And secondly, how do we manage trying, regardless of those difficulties, trying to collect much reliable data as we can? So regarding that, we, we always try to identify the reliable source on the ground, particularly in the communities where the incident happened. And in most cases, we go through the village courts where the cases have been mediated. And the second reliable source that we see are the chats or the faith groups on the ground. And they seem to be all, also in, involved in addressing some of these uh, problems of sorcery. <clears throat> and thirdly, also the village leaders or the peace mediators or elders in the community who are able to uh, give out some of these information. But apart from that, anyone else trying to talk about sorcery is a risk involved. And that's why much of this information could not be able to come out. And how do we actually collect the data to be more exact or get the information as real as much, uh, the truth as much, much as possible? And from my experience, recording of some of these uh, stories or what they share with the, to us through the recorders or through those on the ground doing the research is very reliable because there you can extract what has actually happened. When you deliver questionnaires, Sometimes, because of the illiterate, uh, high percentage of illiterate people in the rural communities, it doesn't really guarantee you to get the information that we may, we may look for. So that's why to avoid even interpretation from those recorders, it's much really uh, important or significant to record actually the people who have been telling. And by recording, people really have the feel the uh, uh, the openness to share what they what they feel, what they have heard, what they have seen, because people are more orally oral tradition. I mean, they come from a very oral tradition where information is passed on orally, not through book, not through a recorded, uh, I mean, written media. So it it gives the the validity of the data when we really record the audios. Like Miranda, when she sent me to I do an interview. I always take my recorder with me to record as much as possible and then try to be exact as much as possible to be to, to provide the, the real information that is coming from the people. So there are those difficulties, but there are also those reliable sources that we can expect our information from uh, those sources that we have on the ground. 
Thank you for that, especially with the listing of the free reliable sources you've been finding now uh, with your research. Sorry, um, one, thing, yeah. one thing that I forgot, uh, okay. also existing, existing information or the data from the police and the nearest health post. Uh, because most of these victims or the survivors, they ran through the police or the health facility. And they don't even share those information with us as researchers. So there is also a difficulty, even though there is a case that went through the police or through the health facility, but we cannot access those information as well. So that's another difficulty that we are also dealing with, sorry. Yeah. No, great comment. Uh, definitely one important to draw out. Um, so uh, now I'm gonna switch over to kind of analytical diversity. Um, so the question I'm posing um, is what considerations should researchers and analysts keep in mind when selecting and applying analytical methods for conflict analysis in Papua New Guinea? Thank you, Caitlin. Um, first, it is important to adapt the methods to the local context. So similar to what Luke was mentioning, a tag that we had to consider collecting data from uh, printed media in Papua New Guinea. Um, and actually PNG is the only country where we are currently doing this. So along the way, we came to understand that printed media in Papua New Guinea offers a much more comprehensive coverage of nationwide events compared to the digital versions of the same publications. Uh, second, the use of local sources is important as they offer a more comprehensive coverage. Um, if we were to look, for example, at international media, we would probably only record just a few violent events per year in Papua New Guinea, since international media is uh, covering only major fighting. Uh, but since we include local media, we have a, let's say, we try to get a more accurate image of the reality on the ground. Third, um, it is essential to work with local experts, leaders, and organizations who understand the context on the ground and can provide deeper insights into different conflicts. Um, in Papua New Guinea, uh, just accessing open source information is simply not enough to understand the complexity of the conflicts. So local expertise, uh, definitely brings additional value in conflict analysis. Um, and lastly, it is also important to be consistent and follow a clear and transparent methodology over time. Although, uh, of course, all, already Miranda and Luke uh, kind of talked about this, how challenging it is, uh, but it is important to, to stick with a, a clear methodology. So this allows for analysis across time, and it is important for identifications of patterns of violence. So for um, long-standing conflicts, it's more, let's say, um, we try to identify patterns and we might be able to get something out of it, let's say, from uh, uh, um, long-standing conflicts. But for spontaneous violence, of course, it's, it's more difficult. Um, so this, the identification of patterns of violence um, um, also allows um, insights into the grievances uh, and um, events that uh, have triggered the uh, uh, violence in the past. And this also helps to design policies uh, to address violence in Papua New Guinea. Thank you for that. Um... If nobody has any interventions, I'll pose the next question. Um, so how can analytical diversity, such as incorporating both qualitative and quantitative approaches, enhance our understanding of conflict patterns in Papua New Guinea or elsewhere where as well, um, as there are specific situations where one approach is better than another? And Luke, you want to go first this time? Um, sure, sure. I'll, um, yeah, so I, uh, this is a great question. Um, I'm sure we could talk about this for, you know, the, the whole, the whole panel. Um, here's what others have to say about it. Um, I guess, I, so I would preface it by saying uh, to, before I get to kind of the main point I would make is that, um, I, you know, I start from the idea that the question that you want answered should really determine the kind of data you collect and the methods that you use to analyze those data. Like in the context of some research design where the purpose is to you know, increase or decrease confidence in some hypothesis about what, what's going on. So in that sense, like I, 
you know, I think that's the usually the the best way to go is think about like what what does the question demand or what's the problem demand. Um, if it, you know, thinking about particularly informative work that's done in places like PNG on on these issues that we're talking about, I think it often does involve multiple analytical approaches. So you know, to me, having deep understanding of the complicated environment, like uh, you know what what um, what Laura was just was just talking about, uh, I think comes often from approaches that are qualitative. And the reasons that I think that kind of knowledge about context matters are, are a number, but I'll, I'll just name three. I mean, one, I think it can really help inform the kinds of questions that you ask and that you don't ask, that some just wouldn't make sense to ask if you knew more about context to start. I think William's discussion earlier of the sensitivity involved in, in gathering information about sorcery is a great example of this. Like it suggests certain kinds of strategies over others um, and you wouldn't know that if you haven't done, you know, if you haven't done the work to really appreciate and know the context. I think two, it can provide a reality check on analysis and results that are recovered from quantitative analysis. And I think this is particularly helpful if you're already worried about data quality in some way, which we often are in these kinds of contexts. Um, and third, it can be very useful for adjudicating between multiple causal pathways or mechanisms that you think might be underlying some main result that you're getting from quantitative analysis, but that, but that, you know, that kind of approach or those kinds of data aren't going to allow you to, to uncover. Um, I think, you know, more broadly, I'll finish on this, like particularly in data scarce environments, whatever the cause of that scarcity, it's, it's really important and useful to be as clear and precise as you can about the arguments that you're posing, the relationships between you know phenomena that you're that you're studying, and that's because the clearer that you can be, then the easier it is to pull out observable implications of your theory, and then we can think about well, what kind of data collection and method could be used, you know, to see whether we in fact see what the argument suggests that we should. So you know, the more of those that you can pull out of the, you know, the, the theory that you have about what's going on, the more likely it is, I think, that you're going to find something that is doable with the data that you have, whether that's qualitative or quantitative or, or some mix. Um, but I think this is, you know, particularly, um, you know, useful in these kinds of environments where there, you, you don't have the luxury of lots of different kinds of, of data to answer the questions that you, that you want. Oh, thank you for that. Um, Miranda, you want to add to it? Uh, thanks, and I agree with um, with what Luke said. Uh, and just picking up on an earlier point where we were talking about what are the limits of newspaper reporting, even the print newspaper. So when we did our four-year study of um, trying to get as much data as possible about socio-accusation-related violence in just four provinces, then we had this um, network of recorders on the ground and they were gathering data about all of the incidents that they heard within their local um, area. And we found that only 17% of those uh, were reported in the newspapers. So, and that was of the, um, of the violent incidents and the incidents that didn't turn to violence, then they weren't mentioned at all. So you get a really, really different picture when you're collecting data at that local level to when you're only relying on the, um, on the printed data. Uh, sorry, on the printed newspapers. So also, I think um, it's really essential to always be doing qualitative and quantitative in this kind of in an iterative way, because um, there is so much danger in, um, in for misunderstanding, um, for miscommunication, for just for going off on the wrong track, for missing out on what are what are actually big patterns, um, because you started off on the you know, with a set of assumptions that actually turn out to be false. So I found that going backwards and forwards between those two has been really helpful. Um, for example, when I started off doing the SARV work, I wasn't aware of, um, of the extent to which children are harmed and the extent to which children are, are actually victims. And so it was only, I think, into our first year that we, we realised, oh my goodness, we have to amend our survey instruments in order to have some explicit questions about the impacts on children. Um, so that is that backwards and forwards, qual and quant, I think is important. Um, and also then 
you start to realize that not only should you be looking for patterns of conflict, but looking for patterns of peacemaking. Um, and so, for example, when I started to look for um, the way in which violent incidents were being reported in the newspaper, I realized that there was a lot of reporting of peacemaking incidents. And so then I was able to say, okay, then this is interesting. Let's start to collect um, data about both of those so that we can see, you know, who are the different actors who are involved in um, in both of those um, forms of, of intervention um, and what are the different forms and how are they um, working together. And in fact, we found that, you know, there are half as many uh, peacemaking incidents being reported in newspapers as violence incidents. So that's a lot of peacemaking that is occurring as well as a lot of, um, of violence. And so that just starts to even out what the, what the picture is. Um, and then finally, I think you always wanted to be going back to people on the ground and saying, hey, this is what I've been finding. What does it make sense to you? What do you think? What am I missing? So having those sort of those um, interrogations with groups of people, um, you know, at NRI, for example, where where William works or at some of the um, the universities organizing those those just those small workshops that don't need to to go for very long, but can be so helpful to make you think, oh, okay, then I've missed that or I've reinterpreted, I, I've misinterpreted um, this particular finding. I should be looking at it in a in a different way. I think, especially um, me as an outsider from Papua New Guinea, you know, I'm constantly needing to just check: am, am I doing this right or wrong? Um, so, and and William has been a fantastic partner um, in that regard. He's always very. Um, respectfully um, saying to me, no, no, Miranda, you've got the wrong end of the stick here. Uh, thank you. Oh, great comments about being kind of very adaptable with the analytic method as it is kind of a give and take of grabbing and what context you have. Um, so now I'm gonna switch kind of subjects a little bit to replicate, yeah, sorry, Re reproducing the results across uh, different groups. Um, so Papua New Guinea is among the most ethnically and culturally diverse countries in the world. Um, in the context of replicating analytic methods for conflict analysis across different groups, um, how can researchers navigate regional and social differences while also identifying commonalities? Um, William, would you take that? Uh, yes, I think there's a lot of uh, differences that, uh, that can be noted from different studies that have been done. Uh, when we look at PNC, this about 70 to 80% of the population are still in the rural settings. And only about 20 to 30 are now living in the urban settings. So when collecting data in the urban settings is a bit different than when you go out in the rural communities. So in the in the urban settings, it, it can be very easy because of the, the language that they can understand uh, when it comes to English or the pidgin, the national language that we have. So in that way, the communication level is very easy and you can easily uh, talk to the people and then get the information. But when you go to the local settings, you have to have a translator and also you have to have an elder who has to tell you what are the backgrounds, what are the things that you do and what are the don'ts that you have to consider. So there are these differences that we also have to have in mind when we go out there to collect data, especially in the rural settings. And then also when we look at the, uh, the, the actual, uh, the differences that we, we can note, when you look at people in the highlands, their way of uh, doing things is different and their cultural, uh, the beliefs, beliefs are also different from those in the, in the coastal land, those in the, in the lower lands. And there are these big differences that uh, we have noted like up in the highlands, there's a lot of uh, violence related to sorcery and other related issues, conflicts. But when you look at the coastal regions, the there's a high level of accusations, but violence is not that very common like that uh, up in the highlands. So there are these differences that we also take, take into consideration when we go into the communities to collect uh, information or to talk to the people about certain issues. So the different, also they have different way of addressing issues. Uh, in some parts of the highlands, people fight to claim ownership or to resolve an issue. And that violence has been part of, you know, 
uh, in this culture for quite a number of years. But when you look at some regional coastal areas, they just silently going back to their cultural beliefs, customs, and then they do things to resolve issues. So these are very different dynamics that we really have to have in mind when we actually talk to the people, or go to collect data and try to look at the issues and identify what had happened and how can uh, we uh, uh, plan for, look ahead for the things that we can recommend to the government or the leader can also see. One thing that we really want to come up with is we try to look at the gap between accusations leading to violence because in many parts of Papua New Guinea, social accusation has been part of their life. But it's a it's a di growing dynamic that we see that violence has been surpassing and it's becoming really common in the highlands and slowly it's moving down to the coast where there's no violence. So there is this pattern that we need to track down in our research findings somehow. So there's a lot of differences and dynamics in different regions according to the beliefs and the customs that people have. Oh, thank you for that. That's a very helpful insights. Um, so I have a question from Miranda. Um, are there risks that research findings may be misinterpreted, misrepresented, or falsely applied to different groups or regions within Papua New Guinea? Uh, what strategies or approaches can help ensure that they are not? Yeah, thank you. Um, and there is real, real risk. Uh, so when I started doing research on sorcery accusation related violence and I went looking for the data that already exists, I found these figures that people kept on citing. And I was like, you know, what is the basis of that? Like there was one figure that was six times more women than men are accused of sorcery. And, um, and people cited this Amnesty International report and it was just recited and recited. But I went back to its original source and it came from a statement reported in a newspaper by some doctor in Garoka in relation to a funding application that they were making, um, just in relation to one part of Papua New Guinea. But then that was taken up as being like a fact. And then, you know, cited because people don't have anything else. And so then it takes on a life of its own. And so that is a real concern. Um, I, I think we just have to encourage people always to cite back to the original source um, and to to make sure that you know you do include all of the qualifications around the validity of the data, of which there are many many qualifications, um, and and try to for everybody to get into a habit of thinking in a skeptical way about numbers. Um, I've also found that when my research findings challenge deeply held assumptions by members of the donor and international community, then um, that's been problematic as well. So. Um, for example, we found that overall there are about, you know, equal numbers of men and women who are victims of SAV in PNG. And depending on which part of Papua New Guinea depends on who is more likely to be um, the, the victim. So in the Highlands, it's more likely to be women. In Bougainville, for example, it's more likely to be men. Um, but you know, the, this is um, this is not the widely held view outside of Papua New Guinea, who really think that it is um, the the targeting of women, particularly older women. And um, so, I found that many people have challenged me about these um, these findings that we've come up with. And in one instance, um, I found a funding applicant. Somebody sent me a funding application that had been written where they had just used all of all of my writing but had changed the words from boys from men and boys to women and girls in order to um to fit in with the kind of the gender um dimension of the I suppose of the call for funding um and even when I wrote back to the um to the funders and explained that this was wrong and this was a misuse of my work then um I didn't ever get any reply and I think that the project was funded uh, so there is, uh, again, um, real problems with people either unintentionally or, unfortunately, intentionally misusing um, data. Oh, wow. Great examples. Um, really helpful to clear that um, and give reasons and examples of misinterpretations. Um, so I'm going to end my kind of guided questions with one to Luke. Um, so how can researchers policy 
policymakers in Papua New Guinea and international community integrate data and analytics into decision making to mitigate the risk of fighting? Oh, um, hard, hard, hard one. Uh, so my hard my bad. thoughts about this, oh, yeah, um, are are really informed by by kind of by doing a lot of work in meeting with government and non government organizations over the years for uh, my research in Afghanistan, uh, and then much more recently being in Port Moresby um, a couple of times over the last several years. Most recently, um, several weeks this past summer you know, meeting with government officials in the context of the project I, I mentioned earlier. The, so a lot of different thoughts on this, but I would stick to one big thing. I think um, for, for those interested in this, I'm not sure, you know, what the audience is here, but for thinking kind of broadly about the international community here, um, I think you need to think really hard about the incentives of the different relevant organizations and the people in them who are making decisions. So I think too often academics like me, you know, who have an interest in having their scholarly work be relevant for policymaking and helping in some way, I think they don't, we don't pay nearly enough attention to this issue. So in the context of incorporating data and advice for decision making that's based on analysis of those data, those who want to do that need to think about how to make the case to relevant partners that the investment of time and effort and money will be worth it. And I would say you can't just, it can't just be, well, this is for the greater good or for good governance or something, but, but for specific organizations that are involved in the process and even for particular individuals, you need to think about the politics of policymaking. So how do you do that? I mean, number of ways I'll hit maybe two. One is I think you you need to prioritize you being some organization or an academic or whoever uh, to build relationships with those in authority and who are tasked with policymaking. And particularly like thinking about the increased attention and focus on PNG by the international community over the last several years, not just on violence, but a number of different policy issues. I worry about this kind of crucial step getting ignored because of its high cost. But there's just no good substitute for it. You, you need to find individuals in decision-making positions who are interested in partnering with you long-term and whose support you can count on. Um, like to give an example from my own experience, I'd be much more successful in my work if I had a physical ongoing presence in PNG so that I could meet with people whose efforts in policymaking I could help with. But, you know, I face constraints that that make that harder for me. I I live where I do. I, I, I teach at a university. It's harder for me to, to do that. But I would say, you know, for organizations with more money, with more staff, I would prioritize this and not just do drop-ins for meetings periodically. Um, and so that was number one. And the number two would be to then put a lot of time and effort into thinking about how to clearly explain uh, how expertise in data collection, in analysis, in research design that's tailored to particular policy problems can yield actionable results um, and then make that expertise freely available. So those would be the kind of tips that I would say. Thank you so much for that. Um, so um, we're nearing the kind of end of our discussion. Um, so I'm going to dedicate a few minutes to questions from the audience, although I don't think anything's popped up so far in the chat. Um, I do have some other colleagues messaging me, so I'll pose a question from them. Um, so how can organizations effectively communicate the findings and insights gained from innovative analytical methodologies to local leaders and stakeholders, which I guess kind of ties into the policy making question that we just had. Um, if somebody would like to. I reckon William should answer that. I feel like I just spoke that. on that. So yeah, <laughs> others could speak on it. William, how do you think that like our SAR findings have been most effectively communicated? Uh, yes, I think uh, the findings that we have uh, based on on self research, it's it's very helpful at this stage, because based on some of these findings, 
we have now new uh, government departments have been created, especially the, the gender-based or the GBD secretariat in the parliament. Because of the findings, they see that the issue on GBV and uh, sorcery accusation related violence as as give as now given the prominence by the government, especially to provide some findings and to provide the government office space so that this issue can be looked into seriously, because it, it's affecting a lot of innocent mothers and children and even the economy of this country. So that's another that's another important thing. It also gives the uh, gives the support to the Department of Justice to really see the downfall of the police force in the country. And some of these findings are now used with the Department of Justice to educate our police on the issue of self. And also it helps the courts, especially the village courts, to make informed decisions based on the values that they have. So our self findings on the research that we have been doing is very helpful for this country at this time. Because now the government has taken a lot of proactive decisions or measures based on some of the findings. Just to jump in, what um, so William has been presenting our findings at various different workshops that um, the, the Department of Justice and Attorney General have been running with both police officers and village court magistrates and human rights defenders all around the country. So it's really been able to um, to percolate down to the people who can really use them. Oh, well, that's good news. Um, glad, happy to hear uh, it's kind of getting out there to more people. Um, check in the chat real quick. Okay. Um, I guess I can pose one more question before we can wrap up. Um, so uh, what data do you think would be most useful for helping both those outside the immediate community and community members engage in peace building, understanding, uh, uh, in peace building, understand the nature of fighting? Um, so kind of getting, I guess, more across the idea of collecting the data and then using it and portraying that still back um, but more in a fighting context if anybody has fighting and violence. Yeah, so perhaps I can uh, uh, mention a few ideas here uh, from the ACLE data. So um, how we kind of try to categorize the political violent events recording in our data. Um, so we, this can be divided into two categories, two main categories, let's say. So the first one um, involves organized, coordinated, and premeditated violence, um, which involves longstanding intertribal and interclan conflicts. Um, and also planned attacks against uh, rival groups. So perhaps this is one way to think about the data that uh, can be found uh, um, in NACLA data set. Uh, and the second category, and um, here is where the problem with the patterns uh, arises, is uh, involves spontaneous reactionary and disorganized violence, such as riots triggered by um, um, criminal acts or vigilantism, so people kind of reacting um, in a in a violent uh, manner to perceived injustice uh, or illegal acts in a communal setting. Um, so e this this trend is also captured in our data. Um, and in in any case, regardless of whether we are dealing with organized or spontaneous acts, um, I would say that violence in Papua New Guinea is amplified when identity factors come into play. And perhaps um, policy policymakers um, um, sh should think about the data in uh, in this way. Go ahead, Marina. Um, and so also jumping on um, this idea about the analytical um, value add that we can we can provide. Um, I've been trying to think about temporal sequencing of um, of fighting and of um, sorcery accusation related violence. So with SAR, for example, we've been really trying to conceptualize it as a bit of a wildfire and thinking about it in different stages and then thinking about what are the different kinds of interventions that you can bring in at those different stages, understanding what are the different um, 
dynamics of, of violence? Like what are the things that escalate it? What are the things that cool it down? Um, how can you how can you slow down that process of, of escalation in order to give that opportunity for the sort of the more local peace building um, to occur, for example? What kind of, and, and when we've done that as well, we've found that there's a real need to, to almost re completely reset the approach at the moment. So at the moment, there is so much emphasis on a very reactive um, kind of intervention style that happens once things have really got out of control. And the state is just unable most of the time to really do something um, useful at that stage. Whereas beforehand, then there is a lot of opportunity to intervene, um, to, to keep things um, from, from getting to that boiling point. And so thinking about that temporal sequencing um, and the different dynamics is, I think, a very helpful way as well um, to, to move forward. Oh, no, thank you. Great points to add. Um, so we are kind of out of time, so I'll just wrap up real quick. Um, wanted to express my sincere gratitude for all our panelists and our engaged audience uh, who's been listening. Analytic methods play a pivotal role in comprehending patterns of conflict, yet determining the most suitable approach is essential. Um, we've explored a range of data collection strategies, analytic techniques, replicability, of analysis and the dangers of extrapolating the findings across different groups in terms of Papua New Guinea um, and the diverse viewpoints and thoughtful contributions from our panelists have made the discussion a very enlightening experience and I look forward to hopefully working with you all in the future. Um, so thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.